All right, so it's the 11th of, uh, what month we got? No, I'm July. 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 Uh oh. Oh, okay, go take a look. So it's the 11th of July, mm -hmm. 2000, what are we in, 8? Eight? Eight. 2008. And we're doing a little interview with, with Norm Swaney. We're out in, uh, we're not in Youngstown, are we? We're, a little, we're in Boardman Township. We're a little south of Youngstown. So we're going to talk a little bit about a few uh, experiences. So if we could talk a little about the Massachusetts jump, and you said you came up the coast. Yeah. Uh, shortly after the uh, formation of the paratrooper groups, and prior to the fact that we were 101st Division, they decided they needed to have in, in, well people to go out. We were on bond jumps and looking for guys to be paratroopers. And so on the weekend, we would make, two plane loads of us, would make a jump in a various city. Our first one was in Charlotte, North Carolina. We would go in after the inspection on Saturday morning. We'd load up on a plane, go out and make a jump on Saturday afternoon, spend the weekend in town with some notable family, and then go back to the camp. This was great. And uh, we, the last one that we had, we flew from Fort Benning clear up to Holyoke, Massachusetts, and landed with a jump supposedly to be on Cape Cod. We got there in the evening. Now, it was a beautiful day to fly up there, and the planes only flew a few hundred feet in the air. There was no door on the plane. You could lay in the plane and look out at everything as you went over all these villages and so on, all, all the way up the coast. In fact, uh, we were quite interested when we got to the uh, Washington-Baltimore area of, of all, all we could see. So then, and we skirted way west of New York. We didn't cover New York area. But we got to Massachusetts. In the morning, they were going to jump the two plane loads one was going to go out first and make a jump on some session, I don't know where. The second plane load was to go and jump in a different area. But the first plane never made it. They, it was a rather foggy morning, and uh, for some reason the pilot misconstrued his instructions and hit the mountain and killed the guys. There was 17, I think, on the plane, and two of them lived. They were both badly burnt and the rest of them all died. Now us, the ones that was left in the second plane, we went out over the ocean at Cape Cod, and coming back in, the pilots were supposed to drop us so that we would hit on the beach. Well, naturally they didn't do that. They gave the signal when we were on the beach and we all landed in the marshes in between. <laughs> and I ended up with both ankles sprained, and I ended up in the hospital for that period of time. Uh, and then uh, got out of the hospital up there for after a few days, came on a tour past my house and back to the camp. So that was an interesting one. Uh, we uh, enjoyed those jumps immensely, but that trip to uh, the Cape Cod area was the last one. They seemed to decide that was enough of that. Now, George Spear must have been on that plane with you yes. that you jumped yes. with. Right. Uh -huh. Obviously, he was not, thank God, on the one that crashed. Right. Now, what was your frame of mind after the crash? You must have known about the crash. We didn't know you about didn't it until know about it. We, we didn't know it had crashed because they went to a different section, and I don't know exactly where they were going to go. Mm -hmm. And we didn't realize that they had crashed at all. We never knew about it at all until we got back to the camp. Okay. They never told us that the, the other plane, but I'm sure some of the officers knew about it, but the, run, the rank and file didn't know about it. So I never knew about it until probably uh, nearly a month later that it crashed. I sh shouldn't say that because uh, we saw newspapers right quick showing about the plane crash, and so we knew it, who it was, but we had no... The company, the military never told us. So there was only two planes that traveled up the coast right. to Massachusetts. Right. Uh -huh. One plane crashed, just about killed everybody on yeah. the plane. Uh -huh. Were both planes F company, or did they take people from different uh, companies? They was a composite group 
uh, it wasn't all ethnically. We were picked by, I think, by stature. We were you know, some of the guys were taller, some seniorities. Now Emmerich Parmerly went along. He's fairly short. And he was from the third platoon. Uh, George Spear and I, I think, were the uh, basically the only two from the first platoon. Okay. And uh, then some of them were from other companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. I can't tell you who else was in the in the groups. Okay. And Sergeant Lee was not my. He was not in the first platoon. He was in third platoon, I think, second or third. But he was F company. He was F right. company. Okay. Yes. All right. Did he go back into the unit, or was he they, knocked out of the war? They, they put him on reserve. He never couldn't serve. He was too too far gone. He was crippled bad, and the burns were terrible. So okay. He, he came back to the unit uh, when we were in Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this had happened while we were still stationed in Fort Benning. But they brought him back to the unit so that uh, we could say hello to him. And uh, we never saw any more about him. Don't have any idea what happened to him after that. Okay. Um, one other thing I was hoping to just talk about a little. The boat ride from New York was supposed to go right <laughs> to England. Yes. And do you have many memories of what was the high or low points of the well, boat ride? Yes, very, very, yeah. very vivid. We were loaded on a ship called the, a British ship called the Strathnaver. And we started out supposedly in a convoy. We left New York at night and uh, we uh, were limited to our vision ability because we were all below decks and they would take a group every so often up on the deck and then he'd be there for half an hour some exercise and back down and so during the day uh, the first day we were in the tail end of the convoy and we could see ships all over creation it seemed to be and behind us was always a couple of little corvettes these are uh, were military weapons at that time or our navy gunners uh, actually sub hunters and the next day, we uh, got up and looked up. Hell, there's nobody but us and three of these Corvettes. The rest of them's all gone. We found out that the Schrath neighbor top speed was about nine knots, and the rest of the convoy convoy was going at about 12 to 14 knots. And so we were left on our own. And when we got west, I should say east of St. John's, Newfoundland, we were below decks, and all of a sudden we could hear these boom, 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 and here these Corvettes were dropping, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call them, the things that they shot up in the air? Oh, depth charges. Depth charges, yeah. yeah. They were shooting depth charges, and we did get up on, some of us got up on the deck and saw these Corvettes just cutting circles around us, mm -hmm. and then we were below, I was back again below decks, and there was a terrible explosion on the ship. Now, whether we were hit by the Germans, one of the death charges, or what, I don't know. Uh, I've heard stories that it was one of the boilers blew up because they were pushing it too hard. One was that uh, we got part of one of the death charges that the Corvette dropped, and some of them said, no, we got scorched by a torpedo. I don't know. Anyhow, we limped into St. John Newfoundland and they tied us up there. And we were still aboard the ship and tied up the base. And immediately there was enormous amount of people come in the ship to do work on it. We were restricted, we couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we were on a ship. So you could hear pounding and this and that and the other thing. And I don't know how they worked on it because the ship was up on the, in the water. But whatever they were doing, they did. So then, they decided the ship was well enough that we were going someplace. And we started out, and immediately it ran aground. <laughs> we didn't get very far, so we went back to the same dock and tied up. And then they decided that we had been on there too long. They had to take groups of us off, and we went to a military base for a day or two. And they, you know, there was. There was 6,600 troops on this thing. One company of WAX, the 101st Airborne, 
the 327th Artillery, and I don't know what all else was on there. But we spent some time in this uh, camp in St. John Newfoundland. And eventually they pulled us all back on the ship, loaded it up, and we started out with a big destroyer as a, as a uh, guard for us. We returned part way down. We came to Halifax, Nova Scotia. The, uh, apparently the Strath neighbor had a shallower draft than the other ship, and it was the Ericsson. And we were transferred from the Strath neighbor to the Ericsson. And after we got on the Ericsson, I think we were six days when we got into Liverpool, England. <laughs> so that was a, a scary situation. And this is the reason why you see that the 101st Airborne carries the American Theater ribbon. Okay. Well, otherwise, we would have never had it, but we were on foreign soil uh, with the American Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing to touch on, you had made a slew of practice jumps in your time as a paratrooper. Yes. Mm -hmm. With the Normandy jump, it's going to be your first combat jump. Yes. If you could touch on uh, when you assembled and got ready to go, and the actual plane ride over, which I know was a night jump, mm -hmm. were you terrified? How scared were you? I mean, what was it like? What was the, your gut feeling? Here? Having jumped so many times beforehand, and being combat ready and making the equivalent of combat jumps, no, we were not uh, scared or anything, but we, we did a lot of face painting and so on that we hadn't done before, although we knew about how to do it. And I wasn't a bit scared going in, not one bit. Uh, we saw, as we got over the mainland, and uh, I don't know how we came in across, I think it was towards La Harve that we came in because we went out over the ocean and then came in and uh, we got quite a bit of flack around us, but nothing hit our craft. And uh, at that time, why, when the signal came on to jump, we jumped. I it was pitch black, and we knew that, Eng that France was full of small fields and big hedgerows. They had told us about that. And so I came down into a small field and couldn't see anything. I finally got out of the parachute, got my machine gun, and I'm surprised I got the machine gun because it landed right close to where I was. And uh, so I collected all my stuff, being very quiet, trying to and hide in the chute because it was white. And that was the first thing you had to do was to hide the chute. So then I decided, hey, I can't stay here, i got to move. We had, at that time, every member had a cricket, a little brass thing that you snap. And so I started out first, I clicked it where I was. No sound, no sound. But by getting down on the ground and looking around, I could see that there was a gate over on one side of this uh, field. And the field wasn't that big. But anyhow, I decided I'm going to head for that gate to get out of this field. And so I did, I slowly crawled. I didn't, didn't get up and run. I, uh, well, I should say I did. I get up and stoop and go a little bit and stop. Click again, try again. And when I got to the gate, there was one of our buddies. And I said, why the hell didn't you answer my click? He says, I thought you were a German. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, during the course of the night, we got out on a road and collected and we had I think at first there was six of us, and then we got another one, and pretty soon we had about 15 men together. And uh, we had one officer, and he had maps, and he tried to decipher where we were. Couldn't picture where we were until we got to a road sign that he could recognize the names. And one of them was Carrington. It was that direction. Well, we're not supposed to be here. We've got to go the opposite way. So we did. And the whole day, we would advance a little bit, walk which from hedgerow to hedgerow, being here, very careful when you got to them. We didn't lose anybody until late afternoon, and we came to one opening, 
and you would stop, run across so that you weren't in line with it. And I was one of the tail end guys to go across, and I stopped, ran, and got across. My buddy would not do that. He said, hell, there's nobody over there. He just walked across and he got killed. He was the only one in the group. And that was the first guy that I got shot, saw him get shot. So that, that was a toughie to take that. And I tried to go back and get him. And the lieutenant says, keep going, keep going. Which was probably the proper thing to do. So that was the, the landing for me. Uh, it took us the part of the next day to get back to our company area and we had missed the major battles that our company were involved in and so we didn't get the help taking the, the designated items. Now it must have been quite a, a load off once you got together with your, your company. It must have been very, a huge very relief. Pleased, uh, very yeah. pleased to get because it that by the time we got with them, we were uh, the Germans had been cleared and we were in a clear area that there was no no gunfire right directly at us. Yes, it was quite a, quite a relief. So that would have been the uh, the June. Now, let me tell you one other thing. You don't think about it as being a problem, but all of a sudden you're fighting fighting or firing your gun and somebody firing at you. And all of a sudden, you're about ready to piss with riches. <laughs> what are you going to do? You have to relieve yourself somehow. <laughs> and I mean, it became a major problem for the guys in combat that, that trying to relieve yourself when you were under fire. Never thought of that. No, nobody ever thought of it. But it does happen regularly. <laughs> now, that was the June 6th, June 7th area. Yes. Now, when you guys went back into combat, like on the 13th area, now, yeah. what was it a battle for you personally? Were you did you experience uh, like a, a true our our company, F company, <coughs> was put in what they called the reserve. We were the back two so in case of the other companies were up on the front line. We were a reserve company, and we were enjoying life. We uh, uh, had. Uh, we had dug foxholes naturally and were able to sleep on the ground, but during the day you was up roaming around and you cooked and you shaved and did things like that. Then came the word that uh, Carrington had been retaken by the Germans, and that is when we went into our first major combat that I was with the company. And uh, we had one enormous battle going into Carrington. Uh, as we progressed, uh, one point there was a dead cow laying along the side of the road. That dead cow was a perfect spot for me to set my machine gun up. I put the machine gun behind that cow with the barrel of the gun just directly on top of the cow's body. Stunk to be hell. But <laughs> anyhow it was protection for me because I could hear the bullets hit the cow and I didn't get a scratch on me. And I was sure glad of that, but I had a good field of fire at that point, and that, that made it great for me. I laid out a lot of ammo. And was that a 30 caliber light machine 30 gun? 30 caliber light. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. and were you, so you didn't even need a tripod? Was yes, it right? no, no, I used a tripod, you did. but the barrel stuck right over the cow. The way, the way it had fallen was it, that uh, uh, with the ground behind her, was high enough that I could set the gun up Right. and uh, use her as a, uh, a car, barricade. Right? Yes, she was a barricade for me and I, I was thankful for that cow that it was there because otherwise I'm sure I'd have been dead. Now, you were wounded at best. Yes. Now, can we go into how that battle began? Or yes. the, that morning of, I think, the 18th is when mm -hmm. you guys started right. attacking? Yeah, right. We uh, were told naturally to get ready to go and everybody was handed a box of machine gun ammunition so every pair, every soldier had a rifle and a box of ammo now you're supposed to run across the field and fall and hit and that's professional interview going on here all right so we're going to okay. try again with the the whole thing in best okay uh, 
we were ordered to move out to a certain area. Every soldier was handed a box of ammunition to carry it. Now they had a gun and a box of ammunition and you're going across a field and you have intermittent gunfire coming. There's no way that they're going to carry that box of ammunition and a gun at the same time. <clears throat> so most of them dropped the ammunition. We went across this open field up to a roadway uh, with tree lines, trees on both sides of the road. <clears throat> and immediately we're in gunfire with the Germans. And I found a spot to set up my machine gun. And at that time, <clears throat> my assistant was named Spaulding. I set the gun up <clears throat> and he had his rifle. See, he had the tripod and the rifle and he carried them both. And he moved away from the gun, which would be the normal thing to do. And I looked around for some ammunition. I couldn't find a box anywhere. Nothing. Dawned to me, hell, these guys are lifted all out in the field. So I had to run back through the field and I got two boxes of ammunition. <coughs> I come back up to my machine gun and while I'm setting up, the order came for us to move. Well, some of them moved on to the, to the right, but some of us were still there when the Germans sent a barrage of 40 millimeter stuff down through the trees. And uh, this was my initial shot of getting uh, shrapnel and wood into my back because I was laying on the ground with the machine gun. Okay, we moved, <clears throat> went past a building where there was an aid group of some sort. Uh, medics had set up a temporary unit. And <clears throat> while we were there, a mortar shell came in and killed a couple of the guys that were in that aid section. I didn't get hit. I got knocked down but didn't get hit. So anyhow, we went on just beyond that and I set up the gun again and again another 40 millimeter, maybe the same one. Anyhow, I got enough shrapnel and stuff in my back that there was, I couldn't go any farther. And so the uh, medic says, well, we'll get you out of here as soon as possible. And uh, so uh, he, uh, we started, there was four of us, we started back along the hedgerow towards where we had been, where we had been in our compound. <clears throat> and here comes a, across the field, here comes a jeep. Now we didn't have any jeeps with us, but here comes a darn jeep. And uh, so he loaded the four of us up on the jeep and we started from there heading back to where we were. And again, we were under fire and he shut, shut the jeep down and got out. We all got out on the ground and laid there for a while until the fire disappeared and then we think the Germans thought they'd kill us all. We got back on the jeep and headed and got into uh, the, where the company headquarters was. So that was my experience, first day being, cat, being shot. And uh, then I laid overnight in a hedgerow. I was, uh, the medic had looked at me and he said, boy, kids, I can't do much for you because I was bleeding all over. The next morning, a British uh, first aid truck, one of their ambulances came. How the British got involved, I don't know. But we were loaded on this uh, ambulance and I was able to walk and get on it. As we go, went back, I found out later, not knowing myself where we were or anything, I was just damn happy to be out of the battle. But we ended up in Brussels. I know that we got to Brussels because of the airport. I don't remember getting on the plane. I don't remember getting out of the ambulance. I don't remember anything from there until I woke up in the hospital in England. So uh, there's a period of days that I have no knowledge of what happened. So you, were, you must have been mm -hmm. drugged or something? Well, no, I think Maybe I had lost shot. so much blood okay. uh -huh, yeah. that I was just uh, pr pretty well out of it. And uh, I woke up in a hospital in England. I was in a hot bath. They were trying to soak the shrapnel out of me. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the, I think of the warm water woke me up. But, but I must have been awake enough to move because I was there. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't been there, they, uh, they would have been uh, stretchering me someplace. 
and so that was interesting and I stayed in the hospital for three weeks I guess this was in September and then I was sent back to our original camp Denford Lodge and when I got back there heck, here's a number of guys I knew and some new replacements were there <clears throat> the uh, supply sergeant had never gone into combat with us he was still there because he had kept all our barracks bags and all our supplies available. Elmer Whitson was there, so he hadn't gone into Holland, to my knowledge, so he, he never made a combat jump. Uh, there was one officer, and I don't know who he was now, had no recollection. But anyhow, uh, we were put back into a barracks of some sort, and we didn't get into the same barracks that we had been in. I need to go to they, they got a group of us into one unit. I need to go so, I always keep hearing about the same town in France, Mormelon. Mm -hmm. so, did you end up there? Uh, when we left England after I was shot and recuperated, we went to Mormelon. Uh, there was a group of us, a bunch of guys that I didn't knew didn't know. There were some of them replacements. A couple of them were guys like me that had been shot and coming back. Anyhow, we got to Mormelon about December the 5th in that area, someplace. And I was, by that time, I had a cold and I was croupy and I couldn't hardly talk. I had laryngitis. And uh, immediately, at that time, uh, Cox was our commanding officer, or a sergeant, Earl Cox, and Howard Matthews was a sergeant by that time, and I was still a Buckass private naturally. I hadn't been there and I was a machine gunner and once you got on a, a weapon like that you didn't very seldom ever move. You were stuck there. Matthews got appointed sergeant when they were in, in Holland later. Uh, but anyhow, what was I at? <laughs> you guys must be getting close to heading up to Bastogne. Oh yes, okay. We uh, Hadn't any more and got together. Uh, well, we went into Bastogne on the 16th, and so I hadn't really got acquainted with the gang that I was with. In fact, I was immediately put back on the first platoon, first squad, machine gun. My helper, I had no idea who he was. Never really got acquainted with him because I was feeling lousy and I was in quarters and I didn't even go out on duty. And then we got the word during the night that the bulge had started and 106th Airborne, or 106th Division, Infantry Division had been overrun. And so immediately we were told, take everything you've got, put it in a supply section, and I get on the trucks. And they brought in trucks that you couldn't believe how many they brought in, uh, and called the Red Ball Express. And we got on these trucks, and we rode pretty well all day. The trucks were there fairly early in the morning, and we rode in those trucks. And you, those trucks, in those days, the trucks were limited to about 30 miles an hour. That's as fast as far as they could go. So we got so far, and they decided this is as far as the trucks were going. And we get off, and we started walking. Uh, we had a few instances of intermittent fire, but in general, we were in in an area that the Germans had not occupied or had left. And so we went to a, uh, an area and set up a night perimeter. And we didn't dig in because, well, we, we tried to dig in, but at that time the ground was frozen so bad that you couldn't dig. And then the next day, the officers were able to work and order the area and we were moved forward farther where I could set my machine gun up along the side of a road. And so we were there from, that was the 16th or 17th of December. And on uh, January the 2nd, our, well, in the meantime, our company had decided that the poor guys out in the holes in the ground needed some rest. So every night they would take a few guys off the line, take them back and let them sleep in a house that was warm. And great, so I would, my turn came. And my assistant gunner stayed with the gun. 
and I slept like a log that night. I don't remember what went on. But I got up in the morning, my paratrooper boots and my overcoat were just mud all over. And so the only thing for me to do was to clean them. <coughs> and I did. I cleaned my paratrooper boots and put on an old pair of uh, combat boots. And my overcoat was hung outside to dry because I had taken some water and got the mud off. And all of a sudden, a runner came in 